Uh, we are here today with Brad Corman, co-CEO of Corman Communities. Brad, thanks for talking with us. My pleasure. Thanks, Todd. Uh, Brad, Corman Communities has properties in both urban and suburban markets. Do you think they need different products, for example, design or amenities? And do you target different kinds of renters in those markets? Or is your approach similar in both places? Well, there's definitely some similarities, but some differences as well. Uh, clearly, when you're building something in an urban location, you're paying more for your land, your construction costs are higher, so you're mindful about every square foot. So units are typically smaller. They still have great finishes, but you're not giving as much square footage to people in their unit, so you try to make up for that in other areas. Great balconies, great rooftop decks, really, uh, really energizing and activating the lobby spaces. So whether it's retail tenants who are providing food services, athletics, uh, something, some other entertainment facility, or within the building itself, uh, fitness centers, movie theaters, massage th uh, therapy rooms, um, uh, golf simulator, something that gives some gives the urban uh, resident something to do outside of their space because their space and the square footage is very valuable. So it, that's a difference for the urban for the urban renter. In the in the suburbs, we can give more space, bigger. We can spread them out a little bit more. We have still have great amenities. Um, a lot of those amenities are outdoor spaces, so it's uh, swimming pools and fire pits and fitness trails and things that that lend themselves to a suburban setting, uh, as well as great amenity spaces as well. Um, the interesting thing is some of the amenities you're giving the ur you're trying to give suburban amenities to the urban renter and urban amenities to the suburban renter. So you're giving the the urban uh, uh, person some outdoor feelings and giving the suburban renter some some urban feelings, walkability. Um, and things that are the same. Package storage is huge at both 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 properties right now for renters. People are 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 shopping online. So how do you get packages from a delivery truck into your building and, and to your residence? Um, bike sharing, car sharing, um, uh, great amenities, great finishes, important to both sectors. So there's some similarities and some differences as well. And uh, is the urban tenant base similar to the suburban tenant base, or are they different clientels? Uh, de depending on need, it's really it's different. You you're seeing less families in the suburbs, uh, in, the, in the urban locations, as you're seeing in the suburbs. So often the person in the, in the, in the city is walking to work. They want to be somewhere nearby their, their employment base, and they're looking for the convenience of walkability and being right there. The suburban person is looking for a little more space. They might have a car. They might be working further away, but they want to live in a certain neighborhood. So they're willing to sacrifice proximity for other conveniences and, uh, and amenities uh, close, close by. Uh, one thing that always comes up when I talk with students at Wharton is whether the pendulum is swinging for the long term away from suburban living and toward urban living. Uh, what are you seeing in your properties, and what do you think the future looks like? Well, your students are absolutely right in the short term. The pendulum has swung to, to urban living, and we've seen it over the last five to 10 years with the number of multifamily starts. The percentage growth is heavily weighted to the urban locations. The absolute number of new apartments, though, still heavily favor the suburbs just by, by, by mere size. So, but there's, there's been a shift, and it's been something that has um, been in the works, and I think will continue for a little while longer. It'll happen until supply starts exceeding demand, and all of a sudden, uh, capital that was chasing those deals, capital, ch you know, as, as land prices go up and construction costs go up and, and returns go down, capital will chase returns back out to the suburbs, and we'll see a shift back outwards. And I think also, once you see your millennials, who are a big driver of the urban, uh, urban, urban movement, once you see them get married, have families, all of a sudden, they want either more space or maybe they want educational options that they think are, are better in the suburbs than what they have in their urban core. Those are the things that will start shifting things back out to the suburbs. But in the meantime, right now, there's been a push to, to that urban living. Your urban properties are in a pretty select set of markets. Uh, how do you decide which cities to focus on? For us, because we're really focused in our urban, AKA portfolio on luxury serviced residences, furnished apartments, we really focus on those markets that cater to transient visitors, to international travelers. They're typically a little more expensive um, than, than other urban locations. So they lend themselves to gateway markets. So we'll be opening our fifth property in Manhattan later this month. We have properties in Beverly Hills, in Washington, in Philadelphia, uh, in London. We're spending some time in San Francisco and Miami. Those are the kind of markets that work for us because we want to be where people are coming and going. And so not necessarily living in the same apartment for years at a time, but really there for months at a time. 
So those are the kinds of markets that are, are interesting to us. And then within those markets, what are the great locations, whether it's Central Park or Sutton Place or Times Square or Rittenhouse Square or DC or Beverly Hills, we want to be where people want to live. It allows us to, you know, to, to pay more for the product, to invest more in the asset, and then realize a higher return on those properties. So that's what we focus on. They are, they are they're great locations, um, but it's on purpose, and it's really focusing on, on transient users. So that explains the, the urban location choice. What, what makes a good suburban location? Yeah, good suburban uh, locations really are focused around a couple different things. So for some people, they're focused on school districts and transportation hubs, transit-oriented train stations, um, great intersections uh, of the highways where people can have great access to get to their jobs and other amenities. For others, it's really focused on lifestyle. So live, work, play, town centers. We're about to break ground in King of Prussia, which is a two million square foot master plan community right next to the second largest mall. It will have retail and restaurants and shopping and office and housing. And some people, that's what they want. It's that urban location in a suburban, suburban setting that is attractive to them. So the, the days of kind of being that in that bucolic, set away, far along, far out of the way location for privacy isn't really what suburban users, renters are looking for today. They want to be in the suburbs, but really walkable or transit-oriented to, to the amenities and, and the lifestyle.